Yum yum. Hey everybody, welcome to this Pixel Fondue live stream. I see we have Frederick in the chat over there, Lucas, Neil, some other people. So it's a little weird for me because I usually have somebody to talk to during these things. So this time I'm just demoing. Um, I just thought it'd be better just to go straight to the demo and um, there's just a lot of technical issues getting uh, another speaker here from halfway around the world and I am not an OBS expert, but I think I can handle this. So, uh, and I am doing a live demo. So I have full confidence in the stability of Frederick's plugin. Uh, Moto sometimes has other ideas, but it's been really stable. So I'm not really that worried about it. Otherwise I wouldn't do this. Uh, okay, so what we're talking about today is discrete particles. So this is a new uh, particle kit from Frederick Weidman from uh, Digital Expressions Sweden, uh, the maker of tropism. And I had been bugging him for, I don't know, probably a couple of years. Like, hey, man, if you ever have time to do this, it'd be great if we had this sort of packing, non-overlapping particle system because uh, I need that stuff for my work. I do a lot of uh, technical animations, a lot of medical animations, scientific animations, um, high-tech animations, often need uh, stuff packed together with replicators that don't overlap. Um, I also do a lot of uh, abstract art and nature art. Uh, this, these lilies, water lilies behind me, they're just uh, kixel assets, but they're packed together using the spherical packing technique, and so they're non-overlapping. And this, it's a big deal because the, the old surface uh, particle generator in Moto was great for its time, but it's really old now, and it's really slow, and there's a bunch of things that could be better about it. And this system is awesome. Um, so what is discrete particles? Well, it's a mesh, and I'm just going to read right from... <laughs> Frederick's website here. It's a mesh and surface volume aware particle system for Moto. Super fast, highly optimized SIMD packing algorithms. So basically it, it's incredibly fast. And I think what Frederick did is he spent a lot of time um, optimizing these algorithms with uh, different CPUs. So there's different versions of the plugin depending on what CPU you have. So when you buy it, you'll see like uh, different download, like two download options for like uh, older CPUs and newer CPUs. Um, so uh, it uses the special instruction sets because it's just super fast. It's also super stable and most importantly, it works like a Moto native item should. And honestly, I think this is a great example for a lot of Moto developers over at uh, Foundry. Almost said Luxology. Um, as long as those guys are new and or newer or newish uh, and and or newer to the team and weren't around when Moto was first developed. And this kit works like a Moto kit should. It works with other particle systems. It works with with weight maps. It works with falloffs. It works with particle modifiers. It works with replicators. It works with mesh ops. You can do, and I'll show you some UV transform and some mesh merging um, and some of the demos today. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great example of what can be done in Moto if it's sort of done right. And, um, and I had a great time testing this over the last few months. And like I said, I just wanted to show it to everybody. I think it's going to be available basically today. And so let's just show a couple more things. So this thing behind me is um, just doing uh, you know, circular particle packing. And I'll show a couple more examples before I actually jump into Moto here. Um, and it'll also do 3D volume packing, which is also seems kind of crazy. And it's super fast. It's like it's just like instantaneous. And I'll show that. So this little spiral here uh, has all these spheres packed in there, and uh, so you could pack in any arbitrary shape or whatever. Just 3D sort of mesh volume you can use. Just plug it in there and fill it full of particles. You could do spheres. You could do cubes. You could also do arbitrary meshes. And so if you look at um, these greebles here, these are you know different uh, shaped meshes, right? So you can see some like long thin ones. Um, sort of rectangular ones, as well as circular ones, as well as square ones. And it'll it'll pack these in 2D, like this sort of like uh, Death Star surface here. It'll also pack them in 3D. <laughs> so uh, you can do all kinds of cool abstract stuff. And I'm just kind of glancing at the, uh, if I'm glancing this way, it means I'm looking at the chat. And again, I'm trying to like, uh, I have an ultra wide monitor. I feel like I need ultra ultra wide because I've got Moto in the middle. I've got OBS on the side. I've got what counts for a script on the far left and then the chat there as well. So 
Um, so let me just show the website real quick, and then we'll we'll talk about uh, we'll just jump into a scene. So let's see. Let me bring up um, a discrete particle website. You should be seeing that. I'm just going to sort of scroll down. So when you buy this, there's a huge number of sample scenes, and I'll I'll keep this uh, live stream up of Pixel Fondue. There'll be other Pixel Fondue videos on this. There'll be I'll see if I can make my scenes available as well. Um, this is for Moto 15 and up, by the way. And so, yeah, so he's got all kinds of distributions here. You can see the volume distributions we've got. It'll work with, like, like I said, fall offs and, and other things, which I'll show. Um, it's going to be great for nature scenes. It's going to, and if you're an ArchViz person who needs to set up uh, stuff for your uh, landscapes and things like that, it's going to be great. It's going to be great for set dressing. I did this tutorial the other day of this sort of apocalyptic. Um, uh, layout. I've been playing Horizon Zero Dawn, and like this would be fantastic for scattering vegetation, scattering debris, scattering trash, and, and it, it, you know, the idea of like being able to scatter this stuff and sort of smush it together and have control over the of the variation with you know, different noises and things like that, and not having to worry about stuff like showing up in the same place and over, you know, stomping on each other and overlapping each other, is so great. And so you can kind of see what's going on here. You're going to be projecting particles onto surfaces. You can see that there. there's all kinds of different projection way gizmos. You can see this massive amount of packing here going on. This almost looks like soap bubbles. Um, you can use weight maps, which I'll show. You can, there's all these controls for, you know, sizing and spacing distributions after it's packed. So you can insert more space between them or, you know, ex enlarge your prototypes or um, remap everything with a gradient. Like I said, Basically, everything that Moto can do is in these, um, in this kit. And and the great thing about, uh, oh, yeah, there's some motion graphics. I can't remember the name of the Japanese artist who did some really cool motion graphics stuff with this. But, yeah, you can animate it um, as well. Um, you know, but Moto has these general systems like fall-offs and weight maps and gradients and things like that. Uh, that are fantastic. And they're really being put to use here. Yeah, there's that... Uh, uh, Yosh, Yosh, I'm not even going to pronounce it, Yoshikai Yuji, <laughs> maybe. Anyway, did some cool stuff there. All right, so let me, before I just go on to discrete particles, I also wanted to mention um, uh, Auto Character System 3 from Lukash Bezerra. This is now um, on sale, and there's a personal license for $100 in addition to a studio license. So we did a live stream with this a while ago. You can do... Um, both uh, bipeds, quadrupeds, you can rig um, things like cars and mechanical objects. It is a super awesome rigging system. I mean, it's a, it's a rigging system on par with anything in any other program that I've seen. And we're really lucky to have it. And what I would suggest to you now that he's made this personal license available, and it's just coming out of uh, the final beta now, is that you support um, if you've got a if you've got a project coming up? I suggest you buy this because it's awesome. I use it for medical animations where I need to uh, pose patients and doctors and stuff. So I'm not even animating with it. I just bring in my model, uh, auto weigh it really quick, do the you know auto rig it basically, and then just pose it with these with this awesome controls here. Uh, but the fact that you can do dinosaurs or dogs or cars or whatever is great. And if you want more great moto plugins and kits for our favorite program <laughs> then you need to support it so i, I totally um, suggest buying this jump in there today and buy it if you're interested and again with discrete particles so i think um i think it's maybe time to jump over i'm just going to check the uh, uh chat here see if i'm missing anything okay uh, williams there good frederick's in the chat and I think um, I think I miscommunicated with Frederick. I think I, he thought maybe I was going to have him on to talk, which would have been great. But like I just can't reteach myself OBS like every two months when I do a live stream. So I was just like, you know what? I just got to like get this out there <laughs> and do this thing. But OK, so let's jump into uh, the Moto demo scene. So let's go over to Moto. Let me bring up. Um... Now, I've got multiple Motos open. And I've got multiple scenes open. So I've got probably about 10 scenes I want to show today. And the first ones I'm going to show are just the basic setup of how this works. I'm going to do just like basic 2D sort of uh, distribution and show all the different things you can do with that. I'll do a basic uh, 3D packing. 
And then we'll do some arbitrary access bounding box packing as well. And then I'll go into some, some specific use cases. So uh, yeah, let me just jump in. And again, if, if anything isn't showing up right, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat. Like, hey, Greg, we can't hear you or anything, but it seems like it's all going well. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go for it here. So, um, okay, so here we are in Moto. And in this scene, it's really simple. I've got a plane. I'm just going to isolate this here. And we're going to be, let me hide my locators. We're going to be packing onto that plane. I've got a sphere prototype. It's really a half sphere here. And then I've got my two dex particle nodes or discrete particle nodes. So when I add discrete particles, you'll see there's four items here in the discrete particles folder, or the dex folder you'll get. If you add a surface distribution, it'll add the ray projection node along with it. And so that's just like a texture locator, basically. It determines where you aim your particles, right? You planar project them, spherical project them, centrifugal project them, cubic, whatever. And same with the volume distribution. You do a volume distribution, it's going to add a ray domain node, which is sort of like a 3D texture locator. It's kind of like a volume where that's going to, the packing is going to be. And so you add those to the scene. And then you add a replicator, which I've got here. And that's it for the basic setup. So for the basic setup to see everything, you hook up your surface distribution to your replicator. Well, let me actually back up. You, you take the item you're going to pack to, which is a plane, and you add it to your surface distribution right there in that plugin right there, surface mesh. And then you plug this into our replicator particle source. And then you plug in our prototype to the prototypes. And so if you look on the scene here, I've got, let me just turn this back on here. So I'm going to hide my surface prototype. And you can see that I'm already sort of packing here, right? Now let's go through some different um, channels of our surface distribution. This is where everything is. And our ray projection, actually, let me do this first. This is our ray projections. Like I said, it's like your texture locator that's hooked in. And right now that's just set to planar. You can also set it to box or cylindrical, hemispherical, spherical. Um, and that's just going to spray your particles on the surface. So if, we, if you watch me, if I move this, you just transform it with like regular Moto transform tools. And I could, you know, rotate it or make it bigger or smaller or whatever. I'm just going to project that down into our surface. And then this um, pink box here, this sort of pink cube, is a just a nice little uh, helper object basically that you can turn on or off you can turn like all there's all kinds of display um options here we could display points we can display the packing that sort of yellow those yellow circles there um this prototype domain now one of the keys here is if you look at my prototype if we turn it back on it's pretty big you want your prototype to fill up basically a one meter um uh, uh area right so uh, default sphere you know one meter radius or actually uh, diameter uh, cube and because the packing algorithm needs to know how big the object is it's packing in there now there are some some controls I'll show you on the service distribution if you forget to do that but this helps you that sort of pink box helps you know like that's how big it's expecting your prototype to be. So if you're using kit bashing items and stuff like that, if you load in a kit bash item, you never know what you're gonna get if you buy it up art station. It may be like a, a bolt, but it may be 20 meters wide. You just gotta scale everything down, a little pre-production into that one meter area as close as you can, or you can use a control, this prototype control on the sur surface distribution to sort of resize it if you forget to do that. I like to like put everything in that little box first. Okay, so let me hide my sphere prototype and we'll get some things here. First of all, we've got um, some number of particles. So I can drag that down. You can see the number of particles going down and we have a particle multiply multiplier. And our packing mode is circular. We can also go to square or cubic or some arbitrary bounding boxes. We'll keep it cir circular for now. And this is also hooked up to Omni Hall. So I can just press C and I've got some Omni Hall defaults here. So just like any Omni Hall, I can just right click and drag to increase my point count, right? That works with pretty much any Omni Hall preset in Moto. And I can right click drag up to increase my multiplier. And you see it filling up all the little gaps there when I do my multiplier. That's how multiplier is just sort of multiplying the number of particles in the scene. And it really is useful for filling in all the little gaps like that. We also have my min size and max size. I have these mapped again to Omni Hall, so middle mouse button, so I can I can drag that or I can just type it in, in here like that. So 0.01 or 0.1 like that. And a minimum size particle, 
So 0.05 if you want them fairly big, or we can go 0.01. So there's a lot of uh, control there. And you can also see it's super fast. Like I can pack, let's turn this up to like, instead of 250 points, let's do like 5,000. And let's turn our min size to, let's just go down by 10, 0.01 and 0.005 or something like that. And it's just, it's just, automatic it's just like instantaneous it's super fast like i've gone up to like fifty thousand particles hundred thousand particles and it's super fast so and i can you know like again i could just you know crank up my max size look i mean it's just super fast i'm just dragging up and down super fast so it's um whatever optimizations he did or whatever sort of math genius thing he's doing there works really well so let me just sort of put this back let's see 0 0.01 i think 0 0.1 and point and oh three maybe or Point 0.1 and point oh 0.01. Actually, I'll make this a little bit smaller, something like that for my demo. Okay, so we've got them packed on here, pretty nice. And let's move on to a couple more things. So we've got a, we've got a chaos channel where you can just kind of, you know, drag that around and increase some randomness. We also have a packing distance and shrink spacing, so I can increase those to sort of increase the space between the particles. So if they're like if you have a bunch of bushes and they're intersecting too much, you can sort of shrink that spacing between them without having to um, uh, repack them. You can also uh, adjust the packing distance, and so you can see that I'm sort of that'll actually shrink your prototype there. So. That is another control. Like I said, you have a prototype scale, so I can bump up my prototype scale here or below. Again, all this stuff is happening just um, super fast, right? So feedback is almost instantaneous, and that's a great thing. And so let's move on to a couple more things. So I right now just have a flat plane, which is great, but you know that's obviously the super uh, uh, best case scenario or most easy scenario. Let's um, make this a little bit harder. I've got another plane here. And this one has some hills in it. So I'm going to turn on my hills here. And I'm going to hide my plane. And I'm just going to plug in my hills to the surface. And now it's packing to some hills. And you'll notice, though, that the prototypes are all, they're, they're, not, they're not conforming to the curvature of the plane. But that's OK. We have a control for that. I'm just going to hide uh, locators here so we can see this a little bit better. So on our service distribution, we have a uh control for uh normal alignment and so if i sort of drag this up you'll see these things starting to align if i put it all the way up at one you'll see that these are aligned to the plane now right so they're you can have vegetation on hills and they will align nicely just like that so there's our normal alignment also we've got some weight maps right so we have weight map support so on this mesh i've got a weight map so if i let me just hide my replicator real quick. So there's the weight map. Hope you can see that right there. And if I turn my replicator back on and come over here to surface distribution, and I have a control for weight map blend. And again, these are all just channels. So all this stuff is animatable as well. You can also put in procedural like gradient animation, you know, uh, nodes and things like that. But turn on my weight map blend. You'll, I just hit one. You'll see what happens. It automatically conformed those to the weight map and a sizing option. So weight map of zero, size of zero, no particles there. Weight map of one, it, it keeps the size at one. So you have really precise control over where you want these with a weight map. And you can see where that's really useful, again, if you're doing landscape stuff, or you're doing scales, or you're doing, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, you can also use, like, you know, procedural animated weight maps. There's some videos on Pixel Fondue where, where I have a bunch of cool, like, effects, like growing effects and moving stuff across the plane, stuff like that, which is pretty cool. These will also support falloffs. All this stuff will be supported at once, by the way. So here I just have a basic radial falloff. Let me just turn it on to the scene here, turn my locators back on. I'm going to hide my ray projection and my uh, particles there. So we've got this spherical fall off. Let me just move it to the side. And you'll scooch this over just a little bit. And I'm going to plug that into the fall off slot right there. So we got spherical fall off is now plugged in. And if I animate my or just move this in, you can see that it's, the fall off is multiplying with the weight map and it's hiding those. Now it's coming out the far side. An interesting thing is, well, you can use this to sort of set distributions. Let's say you can use weight maps or falloffs to, you know, place particles where you want them or delete them where you don't want them. Um, and I'll show other examples of this. 
Uh, you can also use them for cool effects. So right here, you'll see like there's a bit of a, you see the particles sort of dancing around because it's recalculating the packing algorithm as the size of the particle changes. So also you can see how fast it is. But let's say I want to just grow these on the surface. Let's say instead of a half sphere, I'm using like mushrooms or um, some like little plant or something like that. Well, it'll work with particle modifiers as well. And this is where it gets extremely powerful because particle modifiers in Moto are very powerful. And I've got some over here in the schematic and we'll just show you how this works. And so I'm gonna use, let me just unplug this right here. I'm gonna bring in this particle modifier, which sets the weight to zero. So I'm gonna stick it in between my surface distribution and my replicator. So the surface distribution goes into the particle source and you're going to see when I plug this in, all these are going to disappear because the scale goes to zero. So I plug into the particle source and they're all gone. But, you know, I can string as many particle modifiers as I want together. And particle modifiers also accept fall off. So I can unhook my fall off over here. I'm going to bring it in over here. And I'm actually going to keep the fall off. I'm going to have the fall off inverted. So when I move this guy in, you're going to see these guys it's gonna start outside the fall off. It's because the fall off is inverted. These guys are just going to be at zero. But as I move forward, they're gonna go from zero to 100. So now they're just growing into the scene without dancing around. And you can string together more particle mods as well. I can put in particle mods like a particle random modifier to randomize the rotation or the scale even more or uh, the positioning, I could jitter the position, or I could you know, use also use all the replicators controls for those things as well. What's cool is I can also do some things like particle sieve modifiers. Let me just make this guy bigger again. I use uh, OmniHall a lot. So there's, if you, if you get used to like sort of the muscle memory of OmniHall hitting C in item mode and just sort of dragging these channels out, it, it's, it's pretty great. So anyway, so now we've got these little mushrooms all growing here. Let's say I want to have different prototypes. Okay, but I don't want to just have them all randomized in, right? I don't want to just say, wow, this one's a mushroom and this one's a bush and this one's, you know, just randomly. I want some precise control of this. In this case, I want the biggest particles to be one thing and the smaller particles to be something else. And again, that's where you bring in more of these um, particle mods. So I have these particle sieve modifiers and these are set to um, size. And this one, if the size is less than 0 0.07, it's gonna output those particles. And this one, if it's greater than or equal to 0 0.07, it's gonna output those particles. And so, like I said, you just sort of string these things together. So my particle modifier goes in as a particle source into both of these particle sieves, just like that. And I'm gonna just sort of scooch these things over. I'll zoom in, I promise, so you can see what's going on here. And I've got two different replicators now. So I want the particle source to be from the different sieves. And let me just adjust my sizes a little bit. So here you see I've got everything under 0.03 in size is gonna be the sphere because it's coming from this particle sieve going to this replicator. And again, if these are mushrooms, I may have three different variations of mushrooms I got from Kixel or something like that. Those are my mushrooms. And if I wanna mix in some tree stumps or bushes where the toruses are, I could have different variations of those as well. But you can see how this is super useful uh, for doing a landscape or doing an architectural animation or doing, you know, what I originally needed this for is I needed to put, um, a little skin dried up skin particles on it on a on a piece of flesh that this client's uh, laser device blasted off and they were all intersecting and uh which screws up subsurface anime uh rendering so this is you know you know there's all kinds of applications for this but here the particle sieves you can sieve on all kinds of stuff you can sieve on size you can sieve on forces positions uh, particle id uh fall off value slope so I can use particle sieve on a slope of a mountainside to, to I can distribute particles with this, this, you know, with decks, with discrete particles, so they don't intersect, separate them out based on slope. So I have trees on the flat parts and like scraggly bushes on the, on the cliffs. So 
it's super powerful and it just works with all these different Moto systems. It'll even work with Moto's dynamic particles because the Moto's dynamic particles have an emitter called a source emitter, which will take any particle system as a source. So I could plug any of these as a source and it'll emit from these particles. So I can do all kinds of effects. So you can think maybe condensation effects, stuff like that, um, all kinds of stuff. So. I think I can move on. Let me show one more little thing here. I think, you know, uh, points, uh, post sizing. There's actually a gradient here for post sizing. So I can middle mouse and make a click here and I can just sort of, uh, let's say I want, uh, let me just pop this out. Let's say I want, you know, more toruses. I don't want to screw around with all my um, settings in there. I could just drag up my post sizing. So I'm post sizing. So it's like a post processing effect on this gradient. So I want more big ones. So I'm just dragging up this side. So I'm getting more, um, you know, larger size on these guys. Or I can drag it down and get rid of them. So again, super powerful. And that's this is the most basic scene I have here. So let me just move on to 3D packing, which is like. Uh, which is sort of which is sort of mind blowing here. So okay, so let's go to 3D packing. This is um, that spiral I showed earlier with the the glass spiral. And so I just made a, a spiral mesh here with a few uh, mesh ops. And let me sort of um, uh, uncollapse that a little bit. So I've got my spiral container, and I just set that to wireframe mode because I just I don't want it to interfere with what I'm looking at in here. And again, you just you're just doing the same thing as before, but you're adding the dex volume distribution instead of the surface distribution. And it'll automatically add the ray domain right here when you add it. You don't have to add them both, it'll do it for you. It'll hook it up for you. And again, that's just kind of like the texture locator, or in this case, think of it as sort of a Boolean object um, for your uh, scene. So those are in place. And I just hook it up like normal. I've got my spiral container is the volume mesh I wanna fill. And I have my, uh, I'm just using a regular sphere. Again, the biggest uh, screw up people are gonna do the first time they use this is they're gonna forget to make their geometry that they're packing one meter in, in diameter, right? So, so again, you've got that, those post controls on the, um, the node of the distribution node to like sort of tweak that later. But I do think best practices, you know, you know, get your, whatever you're using, your tree or whatever, your, your tree may be like, you know, 10 meters high, scale it down in polygon mode to like one meter. The sizing will be done later. Don't worry about your prototype sizing isn't gonna matter for your scene. The sizing will be done in your network, right? So get it down to one meter. And then I'm just gonna hook this up here. And let's see. got um we turn on whoops let me just make sure i've got everything turned on here is my replicator turned on maybe not somehow i parented my replicator to <laughs> the glass okay so there we go um so th now the ray domain here instead of projecting from a like i said a texture lake locator it's more like a boolean um intersection right so this is i'm just turning it to cylinder you can use a box you can use a sphere Cylinder, I think Frederick could probably add more stuff if you wanted to. And I'm just gonna increase my particle count, right? So I've got 350, let's just bump it up to 3000. You know, boom, just like that, super fast, non-intersecting um, spheres. And I'm gonna bump up my multiplier to like six, boom, they're already there, right? In fact, let's bump this up to five, 6,000, let's just double it. Boom, done. And I'm just filling this guy up. Now, there's a couple of interesting options here. You can, um, so when it fills this up, you can see that I've got, let me see if I can find the right channels here, volume constraint mode. So we have shrink or remove. So let me turn it to shrink. And here you can see it's really full, but we have some guys penetrating the edges, right? So it looks fuller, but they're not all inside that uh, radius. Now that may be fine. That may be fine for you. That may not matter for what you're doing. In this case, I'm sort of enclosing it within a glass spiral. So instead of doing shrink, I'm going to turn it to remove and it's going to make sure nothing is penetrating those edges over there, right? So you can see how full that is. And then I just had um, the spiral glass container there. I'll just turn on. Let's see. Uh, hide my um, stuff there. And so there you go. 
And I, I will say the advanced viewport, I'm just going to go to a little moto tangent here. The advanced viewport is so close. It's just so close, it's almost infuriating because there are times where it looks just fantastic. Um, and there are in it, in it, there, and it supports so many things in the shader tree, like stencil maps and lots of gradient modes. And okay, I was good. And but then again, sometimes it's just not quite there, not quite fast enough. But anyway, so it's looking pretty good here, though. So this is your basic just volume particle packing. Again, I could take my spiral. Let me turn uh, locators back on. So if I take my ray domain and let's say I, you know, transform it, I move it down. And again, it's just it's repacking this in real time as I'm moving this. It's just repacking it. It's not just you know, some simple like kill switch. It's actually repacking everything while I drag that up and down. That's how fast it is. So um, anyway, so there's, that's how the domain works. You want that domain to encompass like a big hug around whatever mesh you're trying to fill, right? So that's that. And that, this is a nice abstract effect, but you can think of, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. And like I said, there's no reason, oh, this works with fall offs too. Should I do it? Should I just throw in a fall off? Let's throw in a fall off. Um, you can, um, let's just do a radio fall off and hook this up. You can do things like, like I said, you can have that source emitter effect. So there's no reason why I can't set up a particle system here where all those balls get emitted using a dynamic replicator. And again, there's 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 um, videos on Pixel Fondue that'll, that'll uh, help you with this and just have them all like dynamically come down out of the tube. One of the problems with using uh, dynamics and uh, like the old surface distribution um, node in Modo is that dynamics don't like things to be overlapping when the dynamic simulation is turned on. They tend to explode outwards, right? You want a little bit of space for everything. And that's where this particle packing comes in. You can control the amount of space between all this stuff. And uh, right, so I see uh, somebody saying, is this animated role, like pouring in the spheres? Yes, yeah, so you can create a, uh, uh, like I'm, this is what I'm talking about right now. So um, you, pouring them in is different. Pouring them in is not doing the pack. You have to pack them in and then you can then come out. Pouring them in would be a, a dynamic simulation, but anyway. So let's, let's just hook up my uh, radio fall off here, plug it in, and there you go. Now they're just right there. Let me hide um, the glass. Let me hide uh, locators even. Let me just, well, actually, let me hide these guys just so I can see a little better. And just move up my um, fall off, and there it is. So you can animate fall offs as well if you want you know, different kind of weird effects or whatever. And of course, you can texture these fall offs, and I'll show some examples of that. So, so I'm just going to keep moving on. I've got a ton of scenes. And I'm afraid I'm like taking way too long here. So I'm just at the real super basic stuff, and I have some really Cool stuff I want to show. Okay, so this is it's going to go a little faster here now that the basics are out of the way. This is an example of arbitrary bounding box, uh, arbitrary axis bounding box packing. So this is interesting. Um, and this is Greeble. So I actually grabbed a Star Destroyer mesh off of uh, one, like, uh, what's the one site? I can't remember it. Anyway, and, and um, Sketchfab and uh just packed a bunch of greebles on there i have a billion greebles i have like i have i have i buy so much stuff from ArtStation. station i have like uh i have thousands of them <laughs> finally have something to do with them um so and what's cool here is with this packing is you see there's these arbitrary shapes there's these sort of long shapes in here and these long rectangular shapes there's circular shapes there's rectangular shapes there's sort of squarish shapes and the difference here is on our surface distribution, and by the way, this will do it in, in volume packing arbitrary bounding box as well as um, uh, 2D packing. So all this stuff should be, again, like uh, Frederick has example scenes for all this stuff. So when you download his the plugin after you buy it, um, and I do suggest you buy this one, uh, you'll have scenes for all this. And so it's pretty easy to, to deconstruct. Um, this one has a slight difference though. So, you know, you have the same projection like I had before, but instead of setting this to, um, you know, circular packing, like I had with the, with the first example or cubic packing, like you might do if you're doing like a flagstones or brick walls or cities, which I'll show an example of, um, you're doing arbitrary bounding box. And there's three different modes here, max scale, average scale and best fit. These are just the kind of the things that looks at for each prototype, the biggest, you know, the biggest one, the average one, uh, or best fit. I always just go to best fit because it's, um, 
it's it's super fast. It's not like you have to mess around. In fact, when you see this Raycast sample mode, uh, I'm not sure if I if I talked about this earlier, but if I go to preview and just turn on my uh, locator here and maybe unhook it from the replicator really quick, you'll see these yellow things here, yellow boxes, and you can change it here. So it's got a bunch of modes: preview, Raycast, and preview and pack, and Raycast and pack. Again. These are all just for setting up some some stuff uh, more quickly, but but I don't even think they're necessary because it's so fast. I never use them. I automatically always just go to the last one, Raycast and Pack. By the way, this is another like first time usage bugaboo where you're gonna be like, ah, oh, it's not working. It's because you had this set to Preview, and you want to make sure it's at Raycast and Pack for every example I've I've shown so far. And maybe maybe Frederick it should just default to that because it's it's so freaking fast it doesn't matter. Um, you can see that's packed on here. Now, the only difference here is not only do you have all these different guys as prototypes. So let's look at my Greebles here. Maybe I can do an um, isolate select and do this. So I've got all these different guys here, right? And so what you'll notice is they're all about the same size. So again, I, I put them in that same basic meter. You know, scaled them all down to fit in that sort of meter bounding box. Now, they can go as high as you want. So it's not just it's not just a meter height. It's just sort of left right. So like a tree, you know, you want to look at it top down and kind of get the crown of the tree or the plant within that meter, and it can go as high, you know, whatever as high as you want. Buildings, trees, whatever. Um, and 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 so you have these in the prototype. We also have this other slot here for AABB prototype. And the only thing here is they have to be in the same order. So this Greeble right here, which is in the first slot of the AAB prototype slot on the distribution node, is also in the first slot of the prototype um, list of the replicator. So that's important. Otherwise, it's going to think this bounding box I'm looking at is actually the wrong prototype that I'm placing there. So they have to be in the same order. That's really the only thing to get at. But it's just, again, it's super fast. And if I just go to service distribution and, and change this, let's say I'll just change it to 100, right? And let's multiple of one and up the uh, size like that. So we get you know really big ones there, right? Well, what if I make them small, like 0 0.05 and 0 0.01 and up the point count to 5,000 and whoops, 0 0.01 or 0 0.05. And I mean, it just pops into place. It just, it just pops into place up my multiple. I mean, it's just blazingly fast, okay? And so let's even have it again, 0 0.025 and 0 0.005. And let's do 10,000 particles. And it just, it just, like, I didn't have to wait for it at all. So um, super fast. And this is arbitrary bounding box. This is the most computationally expensive mode there is and it's just boom done so that's that and as you can imagine we can do with all the weight maps and fall offs and everything at your disposal you can imagine making um all kinds of sci-fi cities and stuff like that with uh with this and so we'll get back to this in a moment and again this is probably just like the first iteration of this um there's all because it works with particle mods any additional particle modifiers added to Moto, and there's all kinds of ones in there, you know, curve particle modifiers, UV transform particle modifiers. There's a ton of stuff in there. And, uh, but Pixel Fondue has videos on all of them, by the way. William, I've done a bunch. William has done a bunch. Anything added. So if Frederick wanted to add some more interesting modifiers uh, that'll work with all of Moto's particle systems, they're going to work with uh, discrete particles as well. Okay. So there's that. I'm going to. Uh, bring up another moto now. Well, actually, let me before I bring up go into some other scenes. Let me just look at the uh, uh, chat. I, I'm sure Frederick. I see Frederick and William and stuff are answering questions. So, going to need lots of greebles. Yes, you are. Art station and flip normals have all kinds of sales on uh, greebles and stuff. It's almost criminal how many you can get. Like I said. If I showed you my, um, if I showed you my, uh, <laughs> my, my kit bash stuff here, you would be, it's almost embarrassing how much stuff I have. Um, okay, so let's move on to some more complicated scenes. Not even complicated, just some real world scenarios. So I've got a whole another moto loaded here. And, you know, great use case is just condensation on a can, right? So here I've got condensation on a Pepsi can. 
know, it's what we've been showing. I'm just using ray projection. I am um, using a syndrilical production this time. I, I hope you can see just that orange line there. YouTube is probably crushing, crushing these little thin lines here. But this is, uh, oh man, drinking some Pepsi. All right, there we go. Um, so it's just a syndrilical, syndrilical projection, getting the particles on that can. Now, if you don't want them in a certain place, you could just make weight maps on the can. Like if I don't want them on the top or whatever, just use weight maps to define where you want the particles, no problem. And I'm just gonna, to make this a little more realistic, I'm going to use a texture fall off. And so this texture fall off uses an image. Um, and it just uses this image here, this sort of grunge image. Again, I think I bought this, this from ArtStation. Um, I buy a ton of these imperfection images as well. You can never have enough imperfection images for roughness maps or whatever. In this case, I'm using it for distribution of particles. And so if I plug this in, this texture fall off, which again, is just using a syndrilical um, mapping, just like the particles are. And I'm just gonna plug that in to my surface distribution here. And boom, there we go. If I turn off my points, and again, this like point size, like I'm gonna crank them up here. I just cranked up the point size to, to five. Um, I could turn it back down to one, or I could turn them off entirely if I want to. So there's all kinds of great uh, uh, display options there. Again, when I say this kit is should be sort of the base standard of of stuff that Moto developers uh, at Foundry should look at. Um, it's not an insult to the, 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 the developers of Foundry at all. It's just that uh, I, I worked with, with Frederick really closely with this. And um, so we had the benefit of, of having a user who uses this stuff all the time. Um, and, but you know, this display stuff is also in tropism. So this is, this is his idea. But just in general, it's just all this stuff is in there. Um, just really professional features. And... Because if you look at the surface distribution, you know, the surface particle generator in Moto, you can't adjust the size of the particles. You can't change their color. You can't even see them on the screen. And you sure as hell can't turn them off when you want to. Because if you hide it, 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 it turns off the entire particle system. So it's just, you know, like I said, it's old, but it, doesn't, it just doesn't work so well. So, you know, here we can see, um, let me just change my shader tree there to something a little better. Again, advanced viewport can be pretty good sometimes. Um, yeah, so, and again, like, you can, I'll have to do a a uh, tutorial where these particle positions are then plugged into a source emitter, and it actually emits this stuff. You can you can do that as well um, using a, a pulse emitter. So, anyway, so there's, there's a can. Looks good. Using a texture fall-off, and uh, that's it. So, let's move on from the can, and let's do, uh, oh, oh, this one. So, this one's a little more complicated. This is a bunch of plants. Okay, so let me just pull out here. So here we've got a, uh, you know, just a nice little nature scene. And we just turn some things on and off here. So in this case, we have three different replicators. We've got, um, we've got ferns. We've got some ground cover and we've got some trees, right? Okay, and we have three different systems over here. Now these look a little bit complicated, but they're not, they're just like everything else. We've got our main ground that we're projecting onto, and, and we've got three of these DEX particle distributions. And like, again, I have multiple prototypes in here. These are just uh, Kixel assets. So there's, you know, half a dozen different ground cover prototypes. They're all plugged in there, and I did scale them to my meter bounding box. I've got three different fern prototypes. I've got like five or six different pink cordyline, I don't know if that's a tree or a bush, uh, uh, prototypes in there. And I've got texture fall offs in all of them. So you'll see that I've got, um, if I look at just my ferns and let's say I unplug the texture fall off for my ferns, I'll just go right here and unplug that. You'll see they're just, just, just distributed over there, right? All right, non-intersecting. And I've got a texture fall off with a hybrid noise texture plugged into it. Looks more natural. And what's cool is I did the same thing with my ground cover. So if I turn on my ground cover, you'll see it just fills in all the gaps there. Because all I did was I used that same hybrid noise texture. Here, let me click that, make it a little bit, uh, give me myself some room here. 
And all I did was um, I just inverted it, right? I just clicked invert, and now it's filling in all the, all the gaps of, of those uh, where the ferns were. So I'm just filling in my ground cover like that. Ferns here, you know, three different fern prototypes, so a lot of variation. And I've got, you know, half a dozen different ground cover prototypes, you know, a lot of variation. And they're all just filling in the spaces that the ferns are, are leaving blank. So you can imagine, like, you know, and I did this really quickly, like a few minutes last night, just making this, you know, you really spend some time in this. You can make some awesome nature scenes. Um, okay, so let's go to our uh, pink cordyline one, because this is a really cool one. And this one, I'm using a curve fall off with a curve mesh plugged into it. And so the curve fall off, let me just show you some uh, parameters here real quick. So it's important to note that this curve is not falling off along the length of the curve at all, right? So the size of the prototypes at the beginning of the curve are just as big as the prototypes at the end of the curve because this line is flat. But it has fall off by distance here with a radius of 100 uh, millimeters. What that means is there's sort of a Think of a, a radius around the curve or like a tube around that curve of 100 millimeters and as you get away from that radius the fall off goes to zero so basically i'm just drawing lines here so if i unplug my curve fall off you'll see these things are just kind of everywhere but i plug my curve fall off back in and i go to my curve mesh and i'm just going to isolate it real quick you can see those curves here i just drew those on the surface and that's what these trees are following. So if I want to, I can have as many curves as I want. So if I come over here, select my um, uh, my curve tool, and I just turn on uh, mesh constraint. So I'm constraining to that background item. And again, live demo here. I hopefully have all the right buttons pressed. So I just push in here and just start drawing a curve. It's going to start adding those trees where I draw my curve. Pretty sweet right? Not the best uh, curve drawing there, but you get the point. So if you're drawing um, curves along the side of a river or a stream or around a lake or around a house, and of course these curves can be plugged into uh, curve, uh, particle to curve uh, mesh op or um, particle modifiers where you can control the number of points along that curve. So instead of just you know, placing um, actually, that's actually a different way of doing it, but 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 I'm not going to get go down that rabbit hole right now. But um, actually, in the uh, 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 whatever it was the uh, apocalypse video I put up recently, I, I showed I could use that for drawing grass and stuff. But you see how this works, and these guys are not going to um, you know stomp on each other. You look at it from the top, like these trees are not intersecting. And if I want to go in and say, you know what? Sometimes the crowds of canopies get together a little bit. I can go to my surface distribution. I could say, you know, I'm going to bump up my prototype scale a little bit. And maybe not that much, but maybe like 1.5 or so. And just get a little bit of um, a little bit of intersecting there like that. Just make them a little bit bigger like that. You know, typically you don't notice if some leaves are intersecting. So again, pretty nice, nice way to work. Uh, just looking at the chat here. Uh, yeah, random time variation on prototypes kills. So so my next, so if we all bug uh, Frederick enough, maybe he'll create a new replicator item that'll work with this stuff and have all the replicator <laughs> improvements that we want. Because replicators in Moto are awesome. They really are. They're one of the best parts of the program. Um, and I got to give credit. I think Stuart Ferguson, one of the original developers and founders of Luxology, created those. Um, but, you know, they're old. They're, they haven't been updated for a long time. So yeah, let's all, uh, let's all buy this and then let's, let's convince Frederick to uh, code a new replicator item so we can have all kinds of animated replicators and rigged replicators and all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, getting away from, getting away from the daydreaming here a bit. So let's look at um, something else. Let's go to, oh, okay, I call this one Cloud City. So this is, this is what it's so I got a lot going on. This is an arbitrary bounding box. And I for my scatter onto me, I'm just using this plane right here. I'm just scattering onto these guys, right? And I'm just, uh, again, these are just tons of greebles. But if I zoom in here, no intersections. Looking pretty good. And by the way, this all works with Octane. So if I... Okay, so I may 
blow up my stream here because Octane is going to take GP far away from streaming, but you know, maybe I'll give it a shot here. So let me turn on Octane and taking a risk here in a live demo, Greg. Hit go and Octane is going to load up and we'll see what goes on here. Weirdly, Octane is so fast. Um, once everything's in memory, it's 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 as fast as like a, a viewport. So now I'm in Octane here. Everything looks better in Octane. It's kind of there we go, Cyberpunk. Let's push over a little bit there. Change my focal distance. Let me focus on these guys or these guys up front. So yeah, super, super awesome, All right? Now, the other thing, um, you know, you can do. There's different tutorials. Some so fun to do for Octane. I think my Octane is probably my camera here. Let's pause it. Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> so hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so uh, Octane will do random color textures and stuff like that uh, with prototypes, um, but it doesn't. You know, you're going to have more flexibility with the motor renderer. Uh, but, you know, th this all works with Octane and Octane scatter node. I'm going to do a big Octane live stream maybe at some point. Um, there's some some major advances coming in from Otoy, which I really think Octane could be further integrated into Moto. But let's let's not turn this into an Octane thing. Okay, yeah, sorry for the audio. It's probably because I turned on... Um, Probably because I turned on Octane. So, so let me know. Can, is audio back, or am I still choppy? Let me know. <laughs> I have a thirty ninety man. I should be able to do. It may not. Maybe it's just that whole, this whole Cloud City scene. Audio good. Audio is back. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So here's another one. This one is, uh, thanks, Neil, Frederick, Andres. Thank you. Audio is good. It was before Octane. Octane, killer of audio. Uh, I clearly need two GPUs and a 3090 or an ultra wide monitor to do these things. Oh, even before it was Octane, advanced viewport was taking it. Yeah. So I, I'm using, I'm using, um, nvidia's studio for the camera to get the blue screen and and uh noise-free audio so i think maybe i'm just putting too much on the gpu here okay so let's look at uv transfer because this is in garments because this is like a really um useful thing i think if you're doing shoes or garments or whatever or game design so this is interesting so i'm not going to go through the whole uv transfer um setup because there's quite a few videos on that but basically what it is, is, on this mesh right here, this mesh has a really nice UV map. And so if I go to the UV map over here, right here, and I've turned that UV map into a mesh using this command up here, UV to mesh, which is I think right around here somewhere, vertex map, maybe it's texture, convert UVs to mesh. And so what I'm gonna be doing is I'm going to be scattering my points onto this UV mesh. You can see it right here. And so I'm scattering onto um, this garment right there. And I'm using a weight map to determine where I want it scattered. So I'm going to select the weight map here. And you can see that red weight map. If I, uh, I think I might be able to isolate it here. Well, you see the red weight map? That's where my particles are, right? And so I'm just scattering the particles on here. This is gonna be a nice like uh, pearls sewn on. It says, can you start with some pattern particles and then do some spacing optimization? You can do spacing optimization post-wise. So what you can do with a pattern is you can use um, texture, uh, which I'll show here in a second. You can use texture falloffs to do patterns. So, um, so hopefully I'm hitting all this stuff on in the comments. So, so here's where it gets interesting. I'm not going to mesh wrap all these spheres onto that, or UV transfer all these spheres onto that garment, okay? I'm just going to UV transfer the particles onto the garment. 
So what I have here is a just a mesh, just a regular mesh. And if you look at mesh ops here, I've got a merge meshes. And I'm merging in the surface distribution node. So again, Frederick's nodes work all across Moto. I can merge a DEX particle node into a mesh. And now they're just points. So they're just points. And so if I turn off UV transfer, I now have a bunch of vertices that are in the same places as those particles. And those vertices will also have um, this transform and P-size maps, uh, vertex maps added automatically. So it retains that information from the, the, the discrete particle distribution node. But now they're just vertices. And I can do anything with vertices. I can rig vertices. I can animate vertices. I can UV transfer vertices. So I'm going to UV transfer those vertices onto the mesh. So now they're on the mesh. And so now I, if I want to change my replicator instead of having the DEX distribution over here, right, I'm gonna have the replicator take my vertices. So here comes my vertices. And now my pearls are on my garment, but they're not on the collar because I use that weight map over here to get rid of those. And they're not on the seam here because I used my weight map over there to get rid of those, right? And now I can do other things, like I think you're talking about patterns. So I just have a texture follow with a procedural dots pattern. Well, I can in plug that into a particle modifier, which is going to change the, vol the scale to 50%. So anything with the dots being white will go down to 50% and black will stay at 100%, I believe. Um, and if I plug that in, you can see I now have dots there. So I just sort of isolate, let me just isolate my uh, replicator here. You can see like the dots, hopefully, the dots here and so I can change my like dot scale to like you know, one so they're really big or I can change it to let me just um, channel haul these so you can see as I'm if I'm dragging these down I've got these dots here right so you can use any texture wrapped on there or procedural pattern to do uh, patterns on your on your stuff so let me just look over at uh, yeah, great time to make t-shirts there you go so yeah so if you're doing like you know characters or something like that you know we're just distributing particles on here and and we're putting those onto our main mesh now what's cool in moto is and i'll show you in the next scene is not only can you throw particles onto the or meshes prototypes in this case i'm just using spheres you know, it could be chain mail, it could be whatever, onto um, these dots, uh, these, this particle system. You could also throw textures on there using particle rep or texture replicators, which I'm going to show in, in the next and last scene. And, and so I can use any decal. So any repeating pattern or whatever, I can put that onto a dress or a shirt or shoes or whatever as a texture that picks up all these different particle distribution and sizing um, parameters from the DEX nodes, right? So super cool, right? And then you can just freeze these, right? You just freeze the mesh operations. And again, you can then rig this with uh, auto character set of three and they can dance around. And those vertices, they're just vertices at this point, will go with it. So again, we're using some really cool, really cool stuff here. Now this, this next one's the one that's kind of gonna like, is one of my favorite ones. So let's jump to this um, last one I have here. And this is um, a lizard. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a lizard here. So let me just sort of uh, turn some stuff on and off. We've got some advanced viewport uh, shenanigans going on here. Okay, so we've got a lizard. And you see it has a weight map. And you see it has scales, right? Pretty cool. Got a lizard. we got scales. By the way, this whole setup, this is Andy Brown's lizard that uh, I think shipped with um, Moto 101. If Andy's not on here, Andy's, I think Andy's working on Nike now. Somebody send Andy this video if he's not here. It took me the entire, the most of the time I spent on this lizard, this scene was straightening out this freaking tail on this lizard because it was all curled around. But anyway, so I just have a syndrilical distribution on the lizard's body here. That's just one way to do it. I could do um, the UV transfer trick like we did with a dress with the lizard. It has good UVs, but just bear with me. I'm just going to do it. Um, with this, this uh, syndrilical distribution and using a weight map, put it on the body. And you think like, okay, those scales, they look pretty good. I like the scales there. Um, 
but let's take a look at it with a texture replicator. So with a texture replicator, I can take my scale. Let me just sort of isolate my scale mesh here. Here's my scale, all right? This is my scale mesh. And so what I did with this is if you come over here to this sort of hidden feature in the sculpting tab, it says geometry to brush. And so I click that and I say height field and I pick a size like 1K going down from Y and hit OK. It's going to make a height field of my scale. This is sort of a ZBrushy sort of um, workflow, right? It's like an alpha in ZBrush. And so here it is, it's just an image and I load that into the scene as a texture. And what I'm going to do is, and instead of replicating the scale onto my lizard, I am going to turn off my replicator and I'm going to turn on in my uh, shader tree, I'm gonna add that scale image to the shader tree and I'm going to, under its texture locator, it has a particle source. I'm gonna use my surface distribution for the particle source. Again, this is kudos to the underlying Moto architecture and um, because I'm not sure what, uh, uh, Frederick even knew that this worked or knew what, the, knew what texture replicators were, but it just works. So you can use any particle system or any vertices as a source for like many texture locators if you don't know what a texture replicator is. So instead of having one texture locator like a planar projection, Every single little particle is its own planar projection and it understands scale of the particle, orientation of the particle, and you know, position of the particle. And so we're just projecting all of these little scales onto our guy. Let me just turn this into, um, now this is, this is a, let's turn it to diffuse color for now. Now the advanced viewport does not understand texture replicators. It's one of the things I'd love to see on there, but I'll just turn on Moto's, um, Preview here, let's see if it uh, tanks my audio, but this time I'm just using CPU, so shouldn't be too bad. And I'm just sort of cushioned here. Also keep in mind, like, um, I'm using, you know, this is a very fat, like this has a 3090 in it, so it's a very fast, uh, it's a very fast GPU, but this is like an eight core i9900 or something. It's like a four year old G CPU, it's not super fast. And you can see what I have here is they're just set to um, diffuse color. So each of these little you know projections of this scale has some built-in controls for like an alpha, and and that's these little um, particle size. One thing you want to do here, just as a tangent, you see my particle size is 1.5 meters. It probably starts with something really small. Remember, our our original particle was a meter, so. You make it really big. So if you do this and you're like, ah, oh, it's not working, it's because you can't see them. You need to up your particle size because it probably starts off like 10 millimeters or something, which is going to be tiny. And here I've got to wait for a motor to catch up and, and render that. Um, but so you want, want to make sure this is big, so 1.5 meters. And then the fall off uh, bias and gain will sort of soften the edges. It's like a radial fall off around each one of those little projections, okay? And so if I take this guy and change it, let me just pause it here. And I change this to from diffuse color to displacement. And now it's rendering this as displacement. You can see it there. Now it's, I don't have that sort of, you know, tacked on look of replicators. It's displacing the geometry of those scales. And you know, it's still live. It's a procedural system. I can just go back to my uh, discrete particle node and make them bigger, you know, you know, change my weight map, paint different sizes of weights to different, get different uh, scales and, you know, sizes of scales and stuff on there. But it works really, really well. And, you know, here's my lizard with a displaced scales on there that are from this particle system. And honestly, I'm sure you can do this in Houdini, but I don't know a lot of other programs that can do this. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's it in terms of demo scenes I have. And I'm just gonna kind of look at uh, the chat now and answer some questions. And I, I don't know how long I've been on. Oh, just about an hour, perfect, okay. so. Yeah, why don't I just um, bring up other moto? Hey, not a single crash. 
Not one crash. Live demo. Not one crash. Good job, Moto, and good job, Frederick. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm just gonna look at the look at the uh, chat here, and anybody wants to throw up um, a question? Uh, what about render booleans? Will those work with texture replicators? I don't see why they wouldn't. It clips away geometry, so it should. But you have the boolean of um, volume distribution with decks anyway, which is the volume domain, and you have the boolean. Uh, with any sort of fall off as well. So you can chop out particles that way. You could chop out particles with sieve nodes. You could chop out particles um, with uh, mesh ops, with uh, uh, delete, um, vertex delete mesh ops, all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, so, so the item is, let's see what we have here. Also. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah. Jawad, Andy Brown missed his awesome tutorials. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, I miss Andy Brown's tutorials as well. I'd like to do more of this kind of thing. You know, I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on for for questions here, but I'm just going to I'm just going to go on a I'm just going to go on a editorial here. <laughs> Let's editorialize a little bit. So, um, you know, we need to. You know, this is the type of thing that I think improves the Moto community. I think buying the software is going to improve the Moto community. So buying this software and buying um, the software for uh, like ACS and all the other stuff, William stuff is going to help improve the community. Um, I'll, I'll see a couple questions here. I'll get to those in a second. But I, I think we need to find a way to keep motivating um, Moto uh, developers, third-party developers to creating for Moto. I think a great way of doing that would be, and I'm just going to come out and say it, I would love to see a non-commercial version of Moto that let people use kits, all right? You can put restrictions on the non-commercial version. That's fine. I expect that. They're selling Moto. Maybe that's resolution. I mean, they have a non-commercial version of Nuke that will let you do up to 1920 by 1080, which is plenty good for a lot of stuff. Um, so it has you know no 4K or no film work or anything, but it's pretty generous for, for Nuke. And there's non-commercial Mari as well. So I'd like to see non-commercial Moto with with either no licensing or like something else for licensing. So that's not a hindrance. But that allows us people who are using it to buy kits because we need to increase the size of the Moto community and we need to increase the number of people to buy Moto kits um, to increase the number of kits. Now, if you look at Blender, of course, it's evolved into nice software. Because um, it used to be kind of, you know, it's been around forever, and it used to, there was some at some point it crystallized into something good from something that's kind of sucked, and so now it's good. You can't go around saying Blender sucks because it doesn't suck. Blender's good, and it has a lot of overlap with Moto. But there's lots of things you can do in Moto that you that that I think people would prefer. Not everybody, but plenty of people would prefer to work in the shader tree over nodes. There's plenty of people who would prefer to work with action centers and fall offs and a great cut, copy, paste stuff of Moto rather than Blender. So there's a huge opportunity for a non-commercial Moto. Most of the million people who use Blender are not using this for commercial work. And, you know, I think if you have a bunch of people on there, if you look at Blender, the most interesting things in Blender are the add-ons and people buy those. Maybe there's a way for Foundry to make money by having an add-on store, I don't know. But the world is changing and business tactics have to change with it, my opinion. So, you know, uh, Greg Brown, who's who's the uh, heading up Moto now, is a has been, um, I think, uh, super great so far. And hopefully this is a, a conversation that, you know, I'm not letting any cats out of the bag here. This is something I just you know want to put out to the community to get some momentum so the community can tell Foundry not Greg Brown. Greg Brown knows what, you know, is a, uh, a Moto expert and a longtime user and involved in the 3D community. I think there's a lot of people found who are necessarily involved in the 3D community because Nuke is the 500 pound uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex at Foundry. And, and maybe they need to hear from Moto users that say, hey, you know, I think there's a big opportunity for Moto here and growing. Um, awesome kits like this, because there's a lot of great developers out there. And if you can build up a community of a couple uh, tens of thousands or a hundred thousand Moto users, all of a sudden it's a completely different ball game for buying add-ons or kits like this. So I think maybe that's that's enough of my um, editorializing, but let me look over here. 
at uh, uh, at the at the chat again. Can particle distribution be tileable? Um, there's probably a way you can make it tileable. I would think. Again, you can massage the particles a lot of different ways with uh, mesh operations and things like that to. Uh, in order to create boundaries um, with weight maps or textures, you'd have to, you know, uh, at the boundary, you'd have to have weight maps or texture fall offs that would lock in scales at the boundary. But if the scales and positions of the boundaries are locked in, it should tile. So that's uh, possible, probably. Um, I think maybe we're just kind of talking about general moto stuff here now. So I'm probably going to going to wrap this up and just let people continue on in the chat. If you want to talk about something else in the chat, I'm looking at the chat right now and I know I'm like 30 seconds ahead, so I'm just going to give it a second. If you want me to to talk about anything in particular in the chat, let me know. Otherwise, we're just going to wrap it up and call this uh, a day with uh, Moto and Discrete Particles. Again, let me um, maybe go back to the website yum, yum. here and wrap up with this so again here's discrete particles and also remember that ACS now has my head's blocking it sorry <laughs> ACS can I move this maybe no ACS has a um, $99 option, and let me let me hide my my fat head here. Let me just hide uh, Greg uh, right there. $99 <laughs> for uh, for the personal license, um, and I would suggest just jumping on that. Like ACS is awesome. We need more ACS tutorials probably. Although Lucas has a ton of sample scenes for that and a ton of um, uh, uh, tutorials as well. So it's actually really well documented. And he's, you know, if you're on Slack or whatever, he's gonna be on there to answer answer questions from you. Um, so back to discrete particles. Yeah, and the only thing I don't know, I, I actually can't remember what, what Frederick's charging for this. I guess I should have known that. Is this on here? Um, Frederick, you put in the chat, what do you, how much is discrete particles going for? <laughs> Seems like an important thing I probably should have mentioned. Let's see if I uh, let the chat catch up here to my talking and see. I think it was around 30 bucks or something, super reasonable. Reload the page, Greg. Okay. Greg is reloading the page by now. Oh, 25. Pay what you want, minimum 25. Wow. So, yeah, so that's a no brainer. Um, everybody, everybody who owns Moto should buy this. <laughs> if you want Moto to thrive, if you want Moto to be better, buy this. If you want Moto to thrive, buy this. If you want more kits, buy this. Um, and the same with ACS. And, um, and that's a very generous price. But you know what? If every if everybody buys it, you know, it'll give uh, uh, Frederick an idea of where he is in the pool. And if he, you know, whatever, maybe he underpriced it, but... You know, that's fine. I think the idea was, let's kind of see where we stand here. So, and it is a steal. So I'm going to go. Anybody else? Nothing else to talk about. I think we're just chit-chatting. I actually have work to do today. And I think there may be another live stream coming up from Foundry. Uh, that Maybe this Friday. Or is it today? I can't remember. But I'm going to jump off now. Thanks for joining. And I will catch you guys on the forums and on Slack. Thank you very much.